Hi, everyone. First of all, I just want to say it's Sabbath, so we can all take a deep breath. Breathe out, relax. You don't have to worry about anything. It's Sabbath. So, let's pray. (laughs) Our Father in heaven, thank you so much for giving us the gift of one day out of seven to rest. And I pray that your spirit will come upon this building and that the things that you have you've showed me regarding this subject, that you will really speak to anyone who has been having questions in their mind or any or anything that has that has really questioned them. And Lord, I pray that you will help everyone to make a complete surrender, including myself, daily, moment by moment. In your name we pray, amen. How many of you have ever heard the name Ernest Shackleton by a show of hands? Wow. No, that's nice. Okay, that's a lot of people. So during the early 1900s, men were intent on conquering or being the first to reach the South Pole. Don't ask me why, but it seems as though God has ingrained an innate sense of discovery or, or we, want to, we want to go places where we haven't been before. And... Shackleton had gone on many other expeditions to Antarctica, but had failed of ever reaching the South Pole. Finally, someone else did reach the South Pole, but Shackleton was not finished. He decided on an even more and bold, daring mission. He and his team were going to cross the continent. Shackleton and his men set out on a, in a ship for the Weddell Sea while expecting another ship to pick them up on the Ross Sea on the opposite side. The problem was their expedition failed, epically, and they never even set foot on the continent of Antarctica. What happened was, I will tell you at the end. So, I want to begin by saying you are all considered a very radical group of people. Did you know that? You, along with millions and millions and millions of other radical people, But in reality, those who consider you to be radical are in the extreme minority. How many of you would die for what a book says? And finally, how many of you are slightly confused? Because when I was speaking about the minority, have any of you heard of aliens? That has to do with it. So what happened was the truth is taught... Sorry. So, to clear everything up, what I just said has everything to do with not one, but three Ps. Okay, the truth is taught us from the very beginning. But it seems as though the very first lesson taught is not why truth is truth. In my own experience, and I suspect in many of your experiences as well, the question has been stated, or the statement has been stated, Live by every word. And you responded by asking, how do I know that every word is true? How many of you believe the word of God when it tells us, love thy neighbor as thyself? How many of you believe the word of God when it implies that we should forgive someone who murdered our entire family? And how many of you would believe black and white letters on a page which is not how I should refer to the Bible, but I want to be brutally honest. How many of you would you believe God's word when it tells you to be faithful unto death and I will give you a crown of life? Maybe many of you here tonight are ready to trust every word. Maybe God has done so many miraculous things in your life that you would have no problem making the greatest sacrifice. But most of us have asked the question, why should I trust my life to the letters in this book? Tonight, by the grace of God, I will attempt to show that we can indeed live by every word of this book. So, each one of you being a strange, radical person who lives only by what a book says is bound to be questioned by someone as to why this is so. And God willing, you will remember the three P's of evidence. Okay? The three P's of evidence of the validity of God's word. The first P, which one was that? Uh, 
Yes. The first P stands for the profundity of God's word. Stands for what? Okay. The second P is the prophetic nature of God's word. And the last P, can anyone guess? Stands for the power of God's word. We will later be using these three Ps in a mock interview of sorts with an atheist. So, but before we delve into P number one, I would like to touch on something vitally important. What is one thing that Christians and atheists all have in common? I would suggest all of that is true, and I would also suggest that we all relate to the world in roughly the same way. Meaning, the only way that the human can gain information, notice the word information, gain information, is through the senses, right? We all taste, see, feel, smell. The difference comes with how we interpret that information. This interpretation of the world around us is our worldview. Everyone has their own worldview, although some are very similar. An atheistic scientist would believe that the only way to know truth is through us sensing the world around us and then using our processing capabilities to make an assumption about the world around us and test it, make a conclusion, and so forth. And you know what? I absolutely wholeheartedly agree with them. Because every one of us senses the world in exactly the same way and in only those ways. You might ask, what about the spirit? Or what about intuition? The spirit is to be guided by the word of God. How do we relate to the word of God? Our eyes, our ears. And this, your eyes, your hands, that's all you got. And that's all you need. So how are we supposed to come up with a worldview that makes the most logical sense? Well, when we are born into this world, we are given two options, God or evolution, and Bible or the world's philosophy. Well, our dear atheistic friend who we'll be asking a few questions today, just maybe pretend he's here, um, would apply this scientist re scientific reasoning to religion and say, I do not go by what a book tells me because that is not science. They say religion is not science. They say that going by what a book says is not interpreting all the information around us. But I don't care because science has not, cannot, and never will be able to tell absolute truth. But really the scientific method, which is, you've used it probably a hundred times today, is only the way that we can take in information. Although the atheist's argument may seem convincing, he has made a fatal mistake. You see, many atheists do not practice what they preach. They're actually being quite lazy in their investigations. We, on the other hand, have taken Jesus' advice to come and let us reason together. We have looked at the evidence and realized that the biblical worldview is much more logical than the alternative. We have decided to take the riskiest and most important scientific experiment that man could ever take, and that is to follow the directions of Psalms 34, 38, to taste and see that the Lord is good. So before you begin to present your reasons for believing in the Bible, make sure to show him that we are both simply trying to find the most accurate worldview that we can. With the information that has been given us, we are both starting on the same ground. We both live on this earth then we can lovingly show him our first reason. So we may start in with the question, what do you think the definition of the word profound means? And this is open to the floor. Or what do you think it means when someone can state something that is profound? Any ideas? Okay. I personally believe that is to state something profoundly is to say a whole lot, just a few words. It's to say a whole lot in just a few words. Ladies and gentlemen, this quality has led a certain book to the peak of literature. No other book but the Bible has the same sheer magnitude of texts that sum up in just a few words what we struggle to explain in political speeches, books, what have you. A house divided against itself cannot stand. Done. It's over. You don't need to talk anymore. I encourage you to read the Proverbs especially. Stop and think about each verse and apply them to your life because if you think about it, the Proverbs were the only practical guidebook 
of what Jesus had when he was growing up. Satan always mixes truth with error, correct? The world has many philosophies. Parts of them are good, while other parts are evil. Every single true view of life that is from the word traces its roots to the word of God. For example, how many of you have ever heard, I'm guessing this is going to be much fewer than the first one, but that's okay, of the physics first principles approach? Okay, wow. Yeah, oh, that's fine. Um, rather than coming from the word of God, I think it describes why the Bible is really so effective. This concept sounds fancy, but we use it every day without thinking about it. Say you're trying to solve a problem. You ask yourself, what is the absolute basic truth that I know about this problem? And then you reason up from there. How many of you have written an essay before? here at Washington Hills. A, a physics first principles approach to writing an essay would be to make all letters in the correct shape and then make the words spelled right and then make the sentences correct and then the paragraphs in the right structure and finally the whole thing. If you do that, your essay is gonna be fantastic. But it's very difficult to think this way. You can't think about this way with everything. To tear down to the root of the issue and ask yourself, what do I know for sure? but it works beautifully. The idea is not to fill your brain with random information, but with first principles, then build off of those. This book has an abundant source of first principles, line upon line and precept upon precept, or in other words, principle upon principle, right? Build every aspect of your life around these principles. God did not give us a guidebook for every facet of life but he gave us principles, and we must apply those principles. May God give us wisdom to do this. May God give us wisdom. And God invented the first principles approach before snooty scientists ever came up with a name for it. My friends, the Bible never copied anyone. All good and true ideas are traced back to this book. So-and-so says something, who heard it from so-and-so, and so forth, and so on, who heard it from Paul, who heard it from God. Every ideology that makes a government successful finds its roots in the word of God. Every principle that we know will make our lives happy and that governs our social relationships, our finances, so on and so forth, stems from the word of God. It may be copied by books, it may be spread by speakers, but the fact that the oldest manuscript of literature around contains every principle ever known to mankind to actually work in our society is a huge testament to the fact that this was not written by mortal pen. My friends, this book is not a random book of facts, narratives, proverbs. This book is the constitution of the universe. But why does Christianity, true Christianity, feel so unpopular in today's world? If I may, I would like to change your perspective on that. Imagine you are in one of those situations where you must stand for the right though the heavens fall, alone. It may seem like you are the only one on the correct path, but in reality, all of heaven is on your side. The countless hosts of heaven's beings, the aliens that are unfallen, are all watching and cheering you on. Not to mention the commander-in-chief of heaven's forces, God himself. By now, our atheist friend's brain is churning, and we can tell, but he obviously wants some more evidence. So, we pull out our second P. Second P. Which is the prophetic nature of the scriptures. How many people here like numbers? Okay. <laughs> numbers are good. Uh, they also can be quite challenging. And But whether you like them or not, data is powerful. It is one of the most powerful forms of proof. And it's kind of one of the most, kind of the form of proof that most people will actually accept. In a way, the prophecies of the Bible can be quantified into numerical values of chance. I don't have any numbers, but 
In other words, what is the chance of someone making a prediction and that prediction coming to pass? If I were to predict that tomorrow a tree will fall, I would probably be right. Because somewhere in the world, I bet a tree will fall. But if I were to say, in a certain number of years, a certain individual will be born in a certain time, in a certain year, in a certain town, he will die in such and such. Or if I were to say, in a certain number of years, or in 300 years from now, on November 16, England will take over America, and we will all be British again. Okay? <laughs> that type and more is pretty much the kind of prophecies that the Bible predicts accurately. One might be tempted to say, well, how do we know the Bible was not just made up after some of those things happened? Of course, that argument simply falls apart after seeing the evidence of how old the Bible truly is. But for sake of time, consider the prophecy of the fall of the Ottoman Empire. We can all agree that the Bible was written before the 1800s, correct? Imagine reading the Bible seeing that the Ottoman Empire will fall in such and such a date, waking up one morning, and Ottoman Empire falls. By now, our atheist friend will be either convinced or he will be stubbornly holding on to his own ideas. A very sad place to be. Which is why the last P might just thaw out his heart a bit. The last P stands for something that each and every one of us craves, and that was power. Power. Power, yeah. um, power comes in many different forms. Many people consider money to be power or political fame or, or just, yeah, money is one of the biggest ones. And the essence of power is control. The most powerful power, if you will, the most sought after power, the only kind of power we truly need, but the power that is the most difficult to grasp, is the power to control one's self. It was a lack of this power that plunged the human race into sin. There are strategies that the world offers that claim to help us exercise self-control. And remember, God does not condemn strategic thinking because everything that is true and right comes from the word of God, amen? And so, although there are these strategies. The Bible offers us a strategy. It's called the plan of salvation. It is a battle plan to help us take back the mind. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, and the battle is in your mind. Our mind must be changed into the mind of Christ. As we surrender the will to Christ, our will will become his will, and self-discipline will be turned into God's discipline. There's no scientific or psychological phenomena to explain why a hardened criminal can take a Bible and go into the woods and emerge a changed Christian with nothing to guide him but the Holy Spirit. Countless lives have been changed by these words. The power of God is the single greatest miracle of God and is the single greatest proof that the Bible is what it claims to be. If you came across a book and you didn't know the author, would you be more or less inclined to believe it? If you came across a book and the author was your dad, would you believe it? Speaking about the power of God, the Bible simply will not be true, proved true for us until we have experienced its power and we have gotten to know its author. Okay, Ernest Shackleton. He's personally one of my favorite role models in history. So remember, Shackleton and his men have set out for Antarctica across what is called the Weddell Sea. Now, the Weddell Sea is different than, say, a California beach in that it is very, very, very cold. So cold, in fact, that the ocean freezes. This frozen layer of water is called pack ice, and it does not freeze in one layer but in pieces called ice flows. And so in order to reach the continent, at least back then without the equipment that we have today, one would need to travel when there was no ice or not much ice. 
But whether or not Shackleton's crew calculated correctly, they ended up running into some serious pack ice. At first, the situation was not threatening, but the wait was very tedious because they were stuck. They couldn't go anywhere. Their ship was trapped. And it turns out they had to spend the whole winter down there stuck in the ice, waiting for spring to come and melt the ice. Now, when you have thousands of pieces of ice being pushed together by wind and rain and snow and water currents, something very powerful, very scary begins to happen. Those pieces begin to come together and push together extremely hard, so hard that chunks of ice weighing thousands of pounds would be shot into the air. And unfortunately, I, I want to give you a little sense of what these men were up against. Their ship was caught between two of these flows. And it was extremely strong, but slowly their ship, called the Endurance, Endurance was crushed and sank. They abandoned ship and began their long stay, float on the ice. Now, first lesson, when your ship is being crushed by ice, and you're absolutely helpless, abandon ship. Surrender your problem to God, and then God will give you the strength and courage to turn right around and face the problem head on which is exactly what these men did. To shorten the story, Shackleton's men ended up floating on the ice for months, changing from flow to flow and undergoing miserable conditions. At one point, someone fell into the water between two ice flows, and Shackleton, by the power of God, lifted him out, this soaking heavy man with one arm. Moments later, the flow snapped back together again. After surviving some of the most extreme conditions, they finally made it to Elephant Island. Don't ask me why they call it Elephant Island, because all it has is rocks and snow and maybe some penguins and ice. Shackleton understood something very vital. In order to save the lives of his men, he must keep their morale high. He must convince them that they would get out, and there, there was hope. In order to save the lives of his men, he, of course, needed to make a rescue because there was no hope of a ship. So he and three other men set out across the worst seas in the world from Elephant Island in a 22-foot lifeboat. Their chances of success were obviously not good. Frank Wilde was the man who Shackleton left on Elephant Island. He left him with this advice. Now, Sha now Frank had wanted to go with Shackleton, but he had said, look, you got to stay here. You're the only man I trust who can keep these men alive and in good spirits until I come back. You must keep their morale high. The remaining men on Elephant Island overturned their remaining boats and put rock walls underneath it. This served as their primitive shelter. It is difficult to describe the amount of suffering these men went through. They even had to undergo an amputation of someone's toes who had been frostbitten underneath this shelter. Imagine with me that you are there, underneath the overturned lifeboat, along with all the other men. It has been months since the boss has left, and you know what all the other men are not saying. That is that they've perished, they've drowned in the Weddell Sea, and it's only a matter of time before we starve to death. Frank Wilde comes in the door, if they had a door, and he comes in, you can barely see him, in the light of, there's not much light in here. You and more than 20 other men are in this small boat that's overturned. And he begins to tell a story. Men, he begins, I was with Shackleton on another expedition to the South Pole, and on the way, we were getting close. We were trudging on. We were so close to the South Pole that we could taste it. But we, he decided to turn back because he wasn't sure that all the men would make it if he had decided to press on. But if, if he had gone to the South Pole, worldwide ad, adulation and fame would have come to the boss. But he wasn't sure that all of us would make it. So we decided to turn back. And on the way back, we were nearing starvation. And we had been rationed several biscuits per day. 
and he came to us. He came to me, Frank. And he literally gave me one of his own biscuits. No amount of money in the world could have bought that one biscuit. Yet he gave it to me out of sheer generosity of heart. Don't you worry. If it is at all humanly possible, the boss will come back for us. Because the boss always puts his men first. Frank Weil knew the kind of man that Shackleton was. He had experienced his self-sacrificing love, and this gave him reason to believe that if at all possible, Shackleton would return. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Get to know the individual behind the Bible, the person who wrote it. Test him. When the sea rises in your life, when the winds howl, when the ice flies at you, it's recorded that the wind would fly at 90 miles an hour, hurling chunks of ice, and if you walked outside and got hit by one of those, it, you're toast. When the sea rises, rely on God. Every morning on Elephant Island, Frank Wilde would joyfully greet the men with the words, roll up and stow, boys, for the boss may be back today. On the morning of August 25, 1916, Frank Wilde said again, roll up and stow, boys, for the boss may return today. But now it had become more of simply a morning ritual. The men were fishing. They had all but given up hope that Shackleton would return. One of the men's eyes wandered up to look at the horizon when he spied a ship. He tore back to the shelter, yelling the news. The men destroyed the wall of their shelter, simply trying to get out. <laughs> they ran to see the ship approaching. The boss had returned. He had traveled over the roughest seas in the world, crossed the impassable, thought to be impassable, South Georgia Island, and had tried multiple times to reach Elephant Island. It was a complete miracle. Every single member of Shackleton's crew survived. And I just want to add that while they were crossing the island, that is South Georgia Island, he felt, his, his team of three men felt as if there was a fourth person there guiding. And there had to have been because the chance of their survival was so slim. Faith that the word of God, of the, in the word of God is true that the word of God is true comes from taking a step that is not yet absolutely grounded in your mind. God may not work some great miracle, but step out into uncertain territory and he will put a rock underneath your foot. He will showcase his power in a way that only you can relate to. The greatest proof that the Bible is true for you is that when we believe that the word does what it says, it does what it says, amen? I present to you the word of God, extremely profound, impossibly prophetic. And when ice grips your ship, when you're absolutely helpless, have faith in the power that you yourself have experienced, and that the boss will be back for you. Let's pray. Our God and our maker, maker of the universe, I pray that you will help us to value your word. They, they're everywhere now. You can find a Bible anywhere, but it didn't used to be that way. And I pray that you will realize that what we're reading is not written by any random author. And I pray that you will help us to realize that so much that we are willing to obey it no matter what. Thank you so much for this day. Please put this all as we go back to our watching. In your name we pray, amen.